ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give you a talk about the world and South Africa in the 1990s. This is a talk I've been making around South Africa in the last six months to as wide an audience as possible. It is not an academic presentation. If I gave you all the material that we put together in Anglo-American, it would take me a day to deliver. So I'm going to hit the highlights of the research that we've done. And I'm going around the world and South Africa in just over 90 minutes. I'm also not going to give you a long-term forecast. We don't like forecasts for various reasons. The first reason is that they very seldom come true. You have to go back to the 1950s and 60s uh, to find a period when forecasting was even remotely successful. And that was because in those days, the future resembled the past. You took a trend from the past, you extended it into the future, and it came true. And of course, it was because the future was like the past. But, but in the 1970s and the 1980s, the world reverted to type. And there was no way, looking back into the past, that you could have captured some of the events of the 1970s and 80s, such as the oil price shocks. As a friend of mine said to me the other day, the future is normally not what it used to be. <laughs> and therefore, in order to capture the future, you have to imaginatively look forward. The second reason we don't like forecasts is very difficult to get bad news across to somebody. Uh, if you tell somebody that's, that something bad is going to happen to him, he blanks out. It's much better to offer the possibility of bad news and a way out and then it sticks. I defy any of you in the audience who've done company forecasts to show me a forecast that goes down. They all go up in the end, and it's because we're all optimists. The third reason I'm not going to give you forecasts is a much more serious reason. If I give you a forecast of what is going to happen to South Africa, I'm saying that the future is decided here, irrespective of any effort that you make in the audience. And of course, that is not true. Everybody can influence the future of this place. There are two kinds of future. There's the active future, which you make happen, and the passive future, which you let happen to you. Today's presentation is all about the active future. And I'm going to show you options for South Africa. It's up to you to choose the option and then formulate strategies to make that option come true. We were very lucky in Anglo-American to be introduced to the scenario planning process in 1982. It had been developed in Royal Dutch Shell over the previous 10 years. And two of their top planners retired in 1982 and came out and worked as consultants for Anglo-American. Now, what is scenario planning about? We presume that the future opens up as a cone of uncertainty. If I asked you in the audience what the gold price was going to be next week, I'd get a range of $30. If I asked you in 10 years' time, I'd probably have a range of $1,000. As you go further into the future, on any parameter you care to name, so it becomes more uncertain. Now, the first job of the scenario planner is to reduce the number of possibilities within reason and to close the cone. We do that by looking at the rules of the game. What makes the world tick? What makes South Africa tick? It's like with the rules of a game of football. If you can understand them, you can rule out certain numbers of possibilities. Same with the world, same with South Africa and we can then narrow the cone of possibilities. We then look at key uncertainties. These are factors that are incredibly important for the future, but you can't say which way they're going to go. For example, in a game of football, a key player may be injured, and you'll only know at the start of the game whether he's going to play or not. That is a key uncertainty. And finally, we flex the key uncertainties and write the scenarios, which are very simple stories about the future, illustrating the options available. So it's a simple three-phase process. Firstly, the rules of the game. Secondly, the key uncertainties. And finally, the scenarios. But it's so much better than forecasting. It offers more understanding of the future. One of the things about forecasting is people do not put their necks out. Uh, as a friend of mine in a large industrial company said, here, it's much better to be wrong than different. <laughs> and that's the problem with forecasting is that it's very difficult to put your neck on a block. With possibilities, you can let your imagination roam. Now, the structure of this talk is, first, we go into the global scenarios that were put together by an outside team of experts. They actually called themselves the Circle of Remarkable Men. And they were really remarkable. We took the best people in their respective fields around the world and put them together in 1985 to do the research.
We then brought them together in Bruges in Belgium for a week in September where we took all the strands of their research and put it together in the material that you'll hear today. So it's not Anglo-American material, this. This is the circle of remarkable men who you're going to be listening to today. On the South African side, we obviously used Anglo in-house resources. Uh, but as I've gone around this country over the last six months giving this talk, I've been greeted in the audience by unassailable logic on occasions, and hence I've had to change the talk. So uh, I've modified it, and it's now more of a modified version of the original talk. So firstly, we'll deal with the global scenarios. Right, the future rules of the game for the world. The first thing we do is we divide the world into the triad and non-triad area of the world. We do not talk about the first world and third world, developing world and developed world. Now the triad in ancient Greek is a group of three. And in our case, broadly, it is North America, Western Europe, and Japan. Those three areas earn over two-thirds of the world's income. And there's only 750 million people living them, in them out of a world population of 5 billion. So 15% of the world's population earns two-thirds of the world's income. Hence, they're relatively rich. $13,000 a head on average. In the non-triad area, you have just under 4,3 billion people living who earn under one-third of the world's income. Hence, they're relatively poor. Their average income is $1,100 a head. So there's a 12 to 1 income differential between the two areas. Now, in the triad, as people grow richer, they have less babies. Probably greater choice and the fact that women become more career conscious. But to have a flat population in a developed country, you need 210 babies per 100 childbearing women. In West Germany, the figure has fallen to 130 babies per 100 women. And hence, the West German population is set to decline from 61 million now to 57 million in 2005. And in fact, the whole of the Western European population will be virtually static um, in the next 20 years. Japan is growing slightly, and North America is probably going to provide most of the increase. The whole triad moving from 750 million people to 800 million people in 2005. Now, as the population growth slows, so the average age rises. Um, in Switzerland and Japan, one-fifth of the population will be over 65 in 2005. That is, that is what we call the geriatric boom. <laughs> and it's going to have very important social consequences in the uh, next century. Uh, firstly, at the younger end, you will find that uh, the schools will start emptying, youth unemployment will start falling, um, and there'll be less juvenile delinquency because there'll be less juveniles. In the middle, uh, you'll find robots more and more coming onto the uh, production line as the active workforce declines. And at the older end, you'll find nursing homes multiplying and there'll be a growing obsession with health care and pensions. So it'll have important social consequences, the aging triad. In the non-triad area, 4,3 billion people will grow to 5,7 billion people in 2005. That's a 33% increase. And they're going to remain young. In some countries, the fertility rate is 800 babies per 100 women. And what one means by young is that 50% of the population is under 15 years old. That is what one means by young. So um, you're going to see as we say in the slide, poor young billions. The whole world population reached 1 billion in 1850. It's now up to 5 billion, and each extra billion is notching up every 12 years, just to give you an idea of how fast the world population is growing. Now, Africa is an extension of the non-triad. It has the fastest growing population in the world. The sub-Sahara population is going to increase from 415 million people now to 840 million people in 2005. That's more than double in 20 years. And in some African countries, the doubling time is now down to 17 or 18 years. So we looked at one critical statistic, food. Now, if you take the average rate of growth of food production over the last 20 years, in the six most populous uh, countries in black Africa, and then you triple that rate of uh, growth of food production, 
many people will still languish in the swamp of malnutrition. If you take the rate of growth and just extend it into the future, many people will fall into the pit of starvation. Now those are scenarios, they're not forecasts. There are certain African countries who are nowhere near the swamp or the pit. And of course other countries will take steps in order to avoid it. But we put it up there as a possibility. Of course, the triad has plenty of food. In Western Europe, there are now one and a half million tons of butter in store, and they're now feeding the oldest butter to cows in order to recycle it. <laughs> in, in the US, uh, in 1985, the corn crop was nine billion bushels. Five billion bushels were stored. So there's plenty of food to feed countries that are in danger of falling into the pit, but of course it's no long-term solution. The one thing that can knock the demographic projection sideways is AIDS. Now all figures on AIDS are suspect at the moment because the disease hasn't been around long enough. But I shall quote you a few of the latest estimates. In Central Africa, it is now estimated that 7% of the population are seropositives. That means that they've been exposed to the virus, but they haven't actually contracted the disease. But 30 to 70% of seropositives actually contract the disease. It is about 5 million Central Africans who are seropositive now. In Europe, there is three quarters of a million seropositives. In America, one and a half million. And by 1991, there will probably be between 50 and 100 million seropositives worldwide. They're looking for a vaccine, but the problem is that the virus mutates into different forms. And a vaccine that is capable of suppressing this year's strain will not work against next year's strain. And secondly, the virus attacks the immune system, which is the very thing that a vaccine is supposed to strengthen. Education is the only way of handling AIDS at the moment. And there are fine programs underway in Africa, and of course, the disease is widely publicized in Europe. So AIDS is very much a wild card, and it could affect all the figures that I've given you for demographic projections. New technologies. The world is going through a burst of new innovation, which it does every 40 to 50 years. The last was just before the Second World War. It produced the television set in 1936, nylon in 1938, and the first practical jet aircraft in 1942. Now those technologies drove the system in the 1950s and 60s. We now have a new batch of technologies which will drive the system into the 90s and into the next century. The first is microelectronics. Now microelectronics is a blockbuster invention. It's changing the structure of the world in the way that the printing press did in the uh, 15th century, the railways and the steam engine did at the, in the middle 19th century, and of course the jet aircraft is done in the 20th century and the television set. What it is doing, it's designing labor out of the system. In 1960, 30% of the cost of assembling a car was labor. That figure has fallen to 7%. In 1930, half Americans were employed in farming and blue collar manufacturing. That figure has fallen now to 18%. 3% of farmers, 15% of blue collar manufacturers. So, People are moving occupations from manufacturing into service, but they're also moving from big to small. In the 1950s, about half triadians were employed on mass assembly lines. The figure now is one third. And in Japan, they're now talking of the dual logic economy, where you have your first logic economy, which are your manufacturing champions, who earn your foreign exchange uh, for you, and are huge and use the latest high tech and your second logic economy, which is your small businesses and informal network, which provide most of the jobs. And there's a symbiotic relationship between the big businesses and the small businesses in Japan. Let me give you a marvelous example. Sony in the early 70s imported this machine from America, which was the size of several filing cabinets, which was used in TV stations. They took it apart and they sent each part to a small business, saying miniaturize this part. Each small business miniaturized its part, sent it back to Sony, and Sony assembled the first Betamax video cassette recorder. And to this day, the component manufacture is done by small business in Japan, the final assembly by big business. So that's why they talk of the dual logic economy in Japan. In fact, that second logic economy is inefficient. For example, 
uh, Japan has 100,000 more shops than the United States for half the population. In Japan, 9% of the working population are farmers, and they only produce 70% of Japan's food. So don't think of Japan as completely efficient. It's not. In fact, in that second logic economy, there are areas of great inefficiency. But of course, it's the way they keep unemployment down. It's below 3% in Japan. So here, in South Africa, we have to learn that lesson about the dual logic economy and having a symbiotic relationship between big business and small business. Biotechnology is where microelectronics was 10 years ago. It's just beginning to take off, particularly in the field of genetic engineering. You take a DNA chain, you splice it apart using enzymes, you insert a new gene, and you have a living factory capable of producing rare substances such as interferon and insulin. They even taken a DNA tobacco from a tobacco plant. They've spliced in a glowworm gene, and now you have a tobacco plant that glows in the dark. <laughs> Apparently in California, they have uh, vines that they're genetically engineering, which can instantly produce classic wine. So Stellenbosch better watch out. There are two other fields not mentioned there. Firstly, photonics. Photonics is where you carry information with light through optical fiber. And optical fiber is very thin. And you can carry, according to a manager at a Brits plant, which I visited the other day, 1,962 messages simultaneously on this one piece of fiber. Well, it means that optical fiber will eventually replace all copper cable for transmitting information. And in fact, they're already talking of uh, constructing a transatlantic and transpacific optical fiber cable. The fourth field is ceramics. It's the science of new materials. And they are looking for composite materials which are lighter and tougher than tin, aluminium, and nickel. And you're going to see the gradual replacement of classic metals by these modern materials. Those four technologies are driving the system into the 90s and into the next century. Favorable values forming. The world is moving away from a single ideology. They're moving towards a pragmatic blend of ideologies. We asked the Japanese, are you socialist or capitalist? The Japanese said, we don't care if you call us socialist or capitalist. We're just successful. <laughs> That's the point. In China, Deng has said, I don't care if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. And hence, they're introducing free enterprise into China, providing it works. In Russia, Gorbachev has exceeded even our team's expectations. He's allowing individual Russians and families to go into the small service sector of the economy, into free enterprise for the first time. And he's allowing Russian companies to go into joint ventures with Western companies uh, for the first time to earn foreign exchange for Russia. And it is rumored that the Politburo are going to pass a law this year allowing manufacturing cooperatives for the first time to go into private enterprise. Now, that would be significant. But Gorbachev's whole policy of glossnost, openness, runs counter to communist practice of holding uh, decision-making at the center. George Orwell, in his book, 1984, actually got it wrong. He said the computer would give more power to the state. Now, as you all know, uh, we live in the information age, and the computer gives more power to the people. And if Gorbachev actually provides people with the technology of the modern information era, such as personal computers, he's going to have to decentralize the decision-making process in Russia. In Europe, governments are now elected on ability to govern and the personalities involved, rather than clashing ideologies. Uh, in Spain, for example, Felipe González, who's just been re-elected Prime Minister of Spain, he, he calls himself a socialist, but he is using free enterprise to modernize the Spanish economy. In France, they've done a U-turn on nationalization. In England, Kinnock has dropped the word nationalization from the Labour Party vocabulary because he knows there's five million shareholders out there in British Telecom, British Gas, British Airways, who will actually possibly vote Conservatives if he thre threatens to take their shares away from him. In America, on a different tack, the melting pot theory is being increasingly discarded, where you force people to become homogenized Americans. Now it is left up to the individual to decide. If he wants to remain part of an ethnic group, so be it. If he wants to become an individual American, so be it. But you leave it up to the individual to decide. In Africa, Julius Nereri has acknowledged that Ujamaa, African socialism, was not the success that he'd hoped it would be. 
and hence they're now privatizing farming and export industries in Tanzania and in Nigeria, and Kenya is well down the road. And the OAU have issued a statement recently saying there is a positive role for free enterprise in the informal sector of any national economy. So here in South Africa, we argue about this-ism versus that-ism, when in fact, we should be looking for a bit of each-ism. That is what we want here. We want a system that works for South Africa. In 600 BC, the Chinese had a word for it, yin-yang. This was the philosophy that the world is a mixture of opposites. Where there's light, there's dark. Where there's good, there is bad. And in more modern times, where there is cooperation, there is competition. And where there is strong leadership, there is participation. Surplus of natural resources. The Club of Rome, in a book published in 1972 called Limits to Growth, predicted there'd be a shortage of raw materials in 1986. Nothing could be further from the truth. Commodity prices were at an all-time low in 1986 relative to manufactured good prices. Why? Because the triad is designing raw materials out of the system. The triad is using 40% less steel per unit of output than in 1970. 36% less oil per unit of output than in 1970. The 7J7 jet will use 40% less aviation fuel than the uh, 737 jet because of the prop fan engine. The lean burn engine, which uses a microprocessor to time the spark in a combustion chamber of a car engine, will use 25% less petrol. A microwave oven uses 5% of the electricity of a conventional oven to cook the identical meal. So the triad where the bulk of the demand for raw materials lies is designing energy and raw materials out of the system. There are three megatrends. Firstly, objects are better designed, like cars and bridges, so they have less metal in them. Secondly, we're moving into more knowledge-intensive objects and less raw material-intensive objects, such as a microchip, which has only 3% raw material in its cost. And finally, the world is moving into services, which have no raw material content whatsoever. So we're moving into the knowledge-intensive 1990s. A victim of these trends is Australia. It has a gross external debt of $65 billion and a current account deficit of $10 billion. And the Australians don't know what to do because most of their exports are primary products. Of course, in this country, we're very lucky to have gold, platinum, and diamonds. If we didn't have that, we would be in exactly the same position as Australia. But it shows that in the 1990s, when our import bill rises, we're going to have to be looking at other fields for exports. But it's not just raw materials that are in surplus. It's engineered commodities as well. For example, 30% of the world's cars are produced by under 700,000 workers in Japan. In theory, the Jap Japanese could produce all the world's cars. Taiwan and South Korea could produce all the world's TV sets. Japan produces the bulk of the world's VCRs at the moment. So you can't just produce a product now. You have to produce it smarter and higher tech than your next door neighbor. You can't just be higher tech. I wonder how many of you in the audience have personal computers in your organizations that just make inefficient routines easier. You've actually got to have a smarter organization as well. Winners and losers, nations and companies. We had to look at what makes a winning nation in the 90s and obviously what makes a winning company because there's going to be a widening divergence between the two because competition is going to be that much stiffer in the 1990s. And we also looked at the phenomenon of world-class companies, these very large companies that straddle the world. Now, on this chart, I could have put education, 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 and education. It has to be the number one thing going into the knowledge-intensive 90s. In Japan, we asked them, what is the key to your success? The Japanese said, the uniformly high standard of our education system in the rural as well as the urban areas. Japan only has a 1% functional illiteracy rate versus 15% in America. In South Korea, they positively educated their population and went from 27% secondary school enrollment in 1960 to 85% secondary school enrollment in 1982. They actually held down consumer expenditure whilst they educated their population. And now they're a player in the world. The fastest selling imported car in the United States last year was the Hyundai Excel. It's a South, South Korean made car. In Britain, just under 50% of British school children leave secondary school at the age of 16, and just over 50% complete secondary school. British educationists will tell you, for that reason alone, Britain is heading for third world status in the next century. In South Africa, 61% of whites matriculate, and between 5 and 10% of blacks. 
That's just not good enough to go into the knowledge intensive 90s if you want to be a winning nation. It means that we have to mass merchandise education here. Of course, people throw their hands in the air and say, where's the money going to come from? But we should use modern technologies. We should use screen-based education using screens and videos. And we should turn four TV channels over to university education, secondary education, primary education, pre-primary education, and roll it every day. In Japan, they only spend 4% of gross national product on education. It's one of the lowest proportions in the triad, and yet they have the finest education system in the triad. It shows that it is quality that counts, not quantity. But it's no good just being knowledgeable. You've got to work hard. Now, you can make people work hard, like Stalin did, or you can create an environment in which they're willing to work hard. We prefer the latter. But there are four key conditions. Now, I talked to a group of senior uh, politicians the other day, and it gave me some delight to give them the first condition, which is small government. In fact, it has to be almost invisible. We went around the world, and the smaller the government, the more successful the nation. There's a marvelous Chinese proverb, govern a great nation like you cook a small fish. Don't overdo it. <laughs> we asked Mitty in Japan, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, what is your relationship with uh, private enterprise in Japan? And they said, we're like the football team coach. We provide the tactics, we look after the pitch, we look after the stadium. But those guys win the matches. They're the champions. We support them. And of course, that is the key. The government is the servant of the people, not the other way around. People here often ask me, where are the black entrepreneurs? The answer is under a heap of regulations. If you've read the first chapter of Leon Lowe and Francis Kendall's book, The Solution, you will see that in the 19th century, there was a thriving black entrepreneurial class in South Africa, which was very competitive with whites. But that spirit was gradually eroded by regulations. The second thing that contributes to work ethic is a sound family system. In Japan, they have a sound family system, and the mother in particular looks after her child's education. In America, between one third and a half of American children experience a single parent family at some stage of their childhood, such as the divorce rate. It is reckoned that of 1987 marriages, 50% will end in divorce. In this country, the message is that we have to phase out things which strike at the heart of the family system, such as migratory labor, and of course we have to provide better housing for poor families. Again, that's not going to come overnight. You have to set a plan. The third thing that contributes to work ethic is low taxation. The Americans have tumbled to this and lowered their tax rates. Japan and West Germany appear to be following suit. And so it's because people will only give incremental effort if they're going to be incrementally rewarded. And the fourth condition that contributes to work ethic is no corruption. As soon as a country goes beyond a certain level of corruption, people say, what the heck, why should I work hard? Because I'm paying all my money over in bribes. So you have to have an open system which minimizes the level of corruption. But you can't be just knowledgeable and work hard. You must be given the capital as well. Now, in the Far East, they save up to 20% of personal income. They have a national savings habit in the Far East. Here. Our personal savings ratio is 5% of income. So even with fairly high corporate savings, we have to import foreign capital in order to grow. The Far East did not need a great deal of foreign capital to cre create their economic miracle. Hence, we need positive real interest rates for a start in order to tempt people to save. But having got the savings, you then have to have a delivery system to deliver them to where they're most needed. Now, of course, the commercial sector is the proper sector to use, particularly with the first logic economy, you use commercial banks to lend the money out. But in the second logic economy, the small business is an informal sector, the risks are often too high for the market to bear. So you must have an alternative delivery system to get the money to that second logic economy. We're not talking handouts now, we're talking of providing capital to people in order to be players in the game. Which brings us to the dual logic economy. We have to create that here. We have to have the big guys who earn the foreign exchange for this country, who compete on the world stage and use the highest tech. Because if you look around the non-triad, what is the bottleneck today? It's foreign exchange. So you've got to have that first logic economy, but you've got to underpin it with a second logic economy, which provides most of your jobs. The University of Stellenbosch 
estimates that 18 million jobs will be required in South Africa by the turn of the century, of which 11 to 15 million can be supplied by the formal sector. That leaves a very large number to be supplied by the informal sector, and that is why we need a dual logic economy in South Africa. In Italy, between 20 and 30 percent of their GNP goes unrecorded. So Italy has a very thriving informal sector of their economy. Social harmony. You can't have one half of the nation fighting another half of the nation. In Britain, they talk about the two Britons, the Britain of the North and the Britain of the South. And, of course, this could hamper growth in the future. In Taiwan and South Korea, they will have to democratize their institutions in order to uh, become winning nations because they're running ragged on social harmony. In this country, the message is that we have to have a system of government which is acceptable to people as a whole. You can't afford to have 25 million angry blacks, but nor can you afford to have 3 million angry coloreds and Asians or 5 million angry whites. You've actually got to have a system that satisfies 33 million South Africans. We think it is possible, as you will see in the second half of the presentation. And finally, you have to be a global player. You have to look outwards. Those countries that look inwards die. We ask the South Koreans, what, is, what has turned you from being called the hermit kingdom? Because that's what they used to be called. And they said when we looked outwards and ranked ourselves in the world trading system, that is when we started as a, uh, making a success of ourselves. You have to have a challenge. When NASA's challenge was to land on man on the moon, they were the finest organization on Earth. But when they had achieved that challenge, of course, they started falling apart. A nation has to have a challenge. We had this American on our team who posed us an interesting theory. He called it the big gorilla theory. And he said to the team, almost a trivial pursuits question, where does the big gorilla sleep? So the team conferred. And we said, in the grass, he said, no. So we said, in the tree, he said, no. So we said, in the cave, he said, no. So we said, give up. Where does the big gorilla sleep? So he said, the big gorilla sleeps where he wants to sleep. <laughs> now, the point of that story is that America has slept where it's wanted to sleep for years and years and years, and it hasn't given a cuss for the rest of the world. But now it's woken up to the fact that there are two other big gorillas out there in the form of the Japanese and the West Germans. And it can no longer put its bed down where it wants to. It too is subject to the disciplines of the world economy. It too is a gl global player. So for this country to actually bow out of the global race has to be the craziest notion of all. We then looked at what makes world-class companies. And we found out that you can't be an all-rounder anymore. The world is too competitive. You have to focus your excellence. IBM wants to be number one in the world in computers. Boeing wants to be number one in the world in aircraft. These companies have a very well-developed vision of where they want to be in the 1990s. In 1948, Sashira Honda stood on an orange box in a garage in Tokyo, and he lectured his 25 employees, and he said, gentlemen, we're going global. Now he is the largest motorcycle manufacturer in the world. He fulfilled his vision. It's vision that separates the world-class companies from ordinary companies. The chief executive officer of a world-class company sets the vision for the company and allows all his staff to participate in its formulation. And progress on the vision is communicated and recommunicated so that the company can find its way through turbulent times. But the same applies to nations as well. Market share is paramount to these companies. It's customers that count. It's customers that are top of the pyramid. That is why Japanese companies in the States have put up their prices very little compared to the appreciation of the yen against the dollar. It's to retain their market share in the US. One head of an industrial company said to me the other day, you're quite right, Clem. In our company, we have a credo. As long as we have the customers, there must be a way of making money out of them. Of course, that's the point. <coughs> You have to have proprietary technology. You can't live on license technology forever because licenses can be qualified and they can be taken away from you. You have to grow your people and skills and you have to have a hands-on top management where the accent is on operational and product excellence. You have to have entrepreneurs at the top of your business who understand the business. They understand the soul of the business. And that's why there are very few state-owned world-class companies. It's because on the whole, bureaucrats don't make good entrepreneurs. In fact, in Japan, 
They visualize their companies as trees, where the roots represent the technologies, the trunk, the people and skills, the branches, the activities, and the fruits, the products. And it takes 25 years to grow a decent tree. Hidden strengths and strategies. In Japan, they call that invisible assets. That is your people, your culture, your skills, your design, your research. In Japan, they invest more in invisible assets than visible assets, like plant, machinery, which appear on the balance sheet. It's because they realize that knowledge is where the world is moving towards. A marvelous story. In 1982, Honda was challenged by Yamaha for leadership of the motorcycle market in Japan. Yamaha said, in one year, we're going to become the number one in Japan. In two years, the number one in the world. And we're building a new factory capable of producing two million motorcycles to prove it. What did Honda do? They wheeled out 81 new varieties of motorcycle over an 18-month period. They lowered their prices dramatically, promoted strongly. Exit Yamaha. Yamaha's market share fell by 9 percentage points in Japan. The president of Yamaha had to publicly apologize to the president of Honda. He had to resign, and the factory never got built. That was Honda unleashing its invisible assets on Yamaha. So where did Honda get those 81 new varieties of motorcycle from? They didn't just come from thin air. They had them in the bottom drawer to use against other companies when necessary. Rapid access to all triad markets. The triad is becoming a universal consumer market. The kids wear Sony Walkmans in Japan, in Western Europe, in the States. They wear the same jeans. They set wear the same shirts. So now, when you produce a new product, you virtually market the identical product across the whole triad. And you have to establish inside bases in the three legs of the triad. On a consumer electronics product, the catch-up time is now three to six months. That's when your competitor will market a look-alike product. So you have to blitz the whole triad with a new product. But secondly, when tariff barriers are thrown up um, against companies, it's much better to be working from inside. Nissan have just opened a car factory in northeast England. Why? It's if Margaret Thatcher ever throws up tariff barriers against Japanese cars. Nissan is operating from right inside the British economy. And lastly, you form alliances where necessary. You crisscross the whole triad with alliances, because in a sense, it's much easier forming a partnership with a company that already has a large market share in a, a country, rather than carving it out for yourself. ATT and Olivetti have formed an alliance to market telecommunications equipment in Western Europe and, of course, in the US as well. So that is the profile of a world-class company. And of course, the proof's in the pudding. We did a very rough sh survey which showed that 77 of the world's top 100 companies and all but one of Japan's top 50 companies follow focused excellence principles. And we include the Sogoshoshas. These are the trading houses in Japan, who one cannot call conglomerates in the Western sense of ac uh, acquisition because they've grown separate trees. And they are really an array of focused excellence operations. Now, we come on to the three main actors in the world. And here, we've taken Western Europe, and we've excluded them as a main actor. Now, the reason is that Western Europe is, for the first time, not riding on the crest of the wave of the new technologies. They're lagging behind. The bulk of the highest tech electronics goods now sold in Western Europe are sourced from Japan and the US. Since the common market was established in 1957, there hasn't been a single example of a private a company, trans-European company of significance, that's been formed. IBM Europe is the nearest, and of course Shell and Unilever predate the common market. So we feel that Western Europe has got to begin combining its obvious strengths together um, in order to become a major player again in the world market. So we looked at Japan, the US and Russia. Japan first. Japan is ultra competitive in a way that none of you will understand. From day one in nursery school, Japanese child is taught that Japan is a poor nation and it's only through dint of knowledge and hard effort that they are where they are today. And they had 300 million people on their doorstep trying to emulate them. These are the Pacific Rim countries that are climbing the technology ladder. And of course the Japanese have to climb it that much faster. They believe in their manufacturing champions like Sony, Nissan, Toyota, who have created this enormous 
current account surplus for Japan of $86 billion in 1986. Of course, Japan now has the lion's share of international lending. The top six banks in the world are now Japanese. The first non-Japanese bank is Citicorp, which is number seven, a US bank. They are probably close to being leaders on the new technological wave. This is because the Americans spend about 50% of their research on defense and space. The Japanese spend about 100% of their research on being an economic superpower. Now, one field we know about is the fifth generation computer. This will be an incredible animal. You'll be able to show it handwritten text, and it will be able to turn it into printed text on the computer. You'll be able to talk to it in English, and the words will appear on the computer. Apparently, in Japan, there is a computer which you talk to in English, and the words appear in Japanese script on the screen. You'll be able to design an entire aircraft in 3D on this computer, rotate it, and uh, do flight simulation tests on the, computer, uh, on the computer because it will calculate all the stresses and strains on the fuselage. That's using fifth generation CAD CAM. Of course, it will cut down on physical models and wind tunnels. A housewife will be able to switch the machine on and orally command it to give the price of all lamb chops in the town that day. It'll appear on the computer. So it'll become a common household gadget. Now, the Japanese in 1982 formed two projects, the supercomputer project for a fast computer and the fifth generation project for an intelligent computer. And through sheer thoroughness, they're moving forward and they're moving equal or even ahead of the Americans. And the Americans are desperately worried. Certainly IBM is worried about this kind of challenge. And Japan, as I said, believes in its invisible assets. This is its reservoir of knowledge, which it needs to go into the 1990s. That's why the brain drain is so critical in this country. And finally, the Japanese are working on a new strategy because of the appreciation of the yen. Uh, it's no longer totally export-oriented. They're going to boost internal demand, we feel, and they're also going to invest far more overseas. Now, the United States is going through a midlife crisis has very good points, very bad points. First, the good points. There's an entrepreneurial revolution going on in the States where the hippies of the 60s, the guys who went to San Francisco and wore flowers in their hair, are now the yuppies of the 80s, the young upwardly mobile professionals. And they're transforming particularly the small service sector in the States. They've created over 30 million jobs in the States since 1970. In Europe, the figure is virtually zero, and that's why the States only has an unemployment rate of 7% versus 11% in Western Europe. They still take the savings from the rest of the world because it is uh, the safest haven. The Japanese invested 27 billion in the States last year. The States has the best universities in the world still. Uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, UCLA, Berkeley, MIT, they are the best universities in the world. The acid test is that the Japanese send their smartest graduates there to finish off, and then they go back to Japan. The Chinese do the same, and they never go back. <laughs> and finally, the States believes in richness and diversity, the Japanese strength in homogeneity. Each model works for the respective nation. A lot of people in South Africa say we're so diverse we can't possibly become a winning nation. That's not true. The States has a working model and so does Switzerland, which is the richest nation in Western Europe. But the latest migrants to transform the US economy are the Orientals. They're turning the place upside down. In freshman class this year in the US, 11% are Orientals, whereas by the law of averages, it should be only 2%. So uh, it does pay in the States to have waves of migrants. Nearly a million Mexicans will come into the States this year. And the States is now the fifth largest Spanish-speaking nation on Earth. On the downside, they have very low pro productivity growth. It used to be after the war catch-up, where you had the States right up here and everybody catching them up. But in critical areas, the Japanese have actually cut through the level of the States and are still growing three to four times faster, such as electrical machinery. It's probably part uh, to do, due to the declining work ethic. They don't save in the state. They save 5% of personal income, whereas in Japan they save 16% of personal income. As one Harvard professor put it to us, the Japanese operate on producer logic, whereas we operate 
on consumer logic. And it's because of the spend-spend society that you have the two huge deficits, a trade deficit of 170 billion and a budget deficit of 220 billion. And somehow, the state is going to have to come to terms with the fact that it is overspending and must draw back to within its means. Though they talk about participation in the states, they don't practice it. Assembly line workers still assemble, whereas in Japan, everybody contributes to the quality of a product through quality circles. And it shows the quality of Japanese products is now in many instances better than the United States products. In cars, for example, in the US, they recently did a consumer survey which showed that the top three cars were Japanese and the fourth was German. There wasn't a single US car in the top four. It shows that participation can lead to better quality. And finally, the States has this obsession with the short term, the quick fix mentality. And investment fund managers are paid on short term results. They put pressure on company operating management to produce excellent quarterly results. And the whole of company strategy revolves around quarterlies. It's called quarteritis in the States. And it's no match for the 25 year Japanese strategy of growing trees. Now you have to ask yourself, is there anything unusual about the United States going through this traumatic period? The answer is no. If you go back to in history, there are two laws of nations. The first law says that no nation has held the number one position for long. And the second law of nations is that no nation that has lost the number one position has ever regained it. If you go back to 1650, the Dutch were the number one nation on this earth in terms of manufacturing. By 1750, they turned into a nation of traders and tulip fanciers. And it was the British turn to take off with the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s. By 1870, they reached a peak of 32% of world industrial output. And of course, they'd become more concerned with administering the British Empire by then than retaining manufacturing excellence. And then it was the Americans' turn to take off. And they peaked at 42% of world industrial output in the late 20s and have consistently declined since to 28%. The Japanese are around about 13% and the British are 4%. So nations come and go. If you go into the future, the Japanese may go over the top in the year 2000. By then, they'll have a trillion dollars worth of assets overseas on which they earn invisible income and perhaps a declining manufacturing core at home. And they will slide down. And who will it be in 2050? We think it might be the Chinese for the first comeback ever. Now, if you go further back in history, where are the Egyptians now? They were the leading edge of civilization in Alexandra. Where are the philosophical Greeks, the mathematical Greeks, and where are the invincible Romans? They all vanish. Now, before we move to Russia, let's look at the different way of doing business between the Americans and the Japanese. The Americans rely on individual brilliance. They have won 130 Nobel Prizes in science, whereas the Japanese have only won four. But the middle 80% of Japanese are probably ahead of the middle 80% of Americans because of the uniformly high standard of education in Japan. They don't have teamwork uh, in the States because it's illegal collusion between companies. In Japan, you target a profitable export niche, you assemble a team of major companies, universities, and MITI, and formulate a long-term strategy to achieve a dominant position. You jointly optimize the process and product design, and then you severally mass proliferate the product throughout the triad to achieve lowest unit costs. And that second model invariably defeats the first model in most fields. In the 1960s, it was TV sets. In the 1970s, it was microchips. The Japanese formed this project called the VLSI project, very large scale integration project in the mid 70s. And by 1983, they were turning out 256K RAM chips, which were superior in quality to American chips. Through sheer thoroughness and the team effort, Japanese call microchips the rice of industry. Um, in the 1980s, it was numerically controlled machine tools, and now it's the fifth generation computer project. So, the Americans, of course, are getting upset about this because they feel that the Japanese take their basic ideas and turn them into superb products, products, which is, of course, what the Japanese do. But the states feel that they should be paid for the transfer of knowledge. And as you will see, it's one of the key uncertainties when we come to the global scenarios. The Japanese model is very yin-yang. First step, you cooperate. Second step, you cooperate. 
third step you cooperate, then you compete. Now Russia is going through a very interesting stage. We actually think Gorbachev is going to turn Russia around, though many skeptics will tell you that it is too early to say. But he's young, he's got charisma, and he is certainly popular amongst Russian people. And already, last year, grain production picked up and oil production picked up. And vodka consumption was down. <laughs> Their GDP growth per capita has come down from 4% in the 1960s to about 1% over the last five years. Though last year, it could have gone up to 2%. But Gorbachev has constantly talked of the weak Russian economy and how it needs to be turned around. There are, however, three constraints to the Russian economy. The first is manpower. In European Russia, the labor force is declining, and it is expected to decline further. The fertility rate of European Russians is below that of Soviets in the Asiatic republics and those in the East. And hence, not only is there a skills mismatch developing in the Russian economy, but it poses interesting power problems for the Russians as well, since they control the levers of power in the Soviet Union. They have declining productivity of capital, as we all know, uh, in, in agriculture. But in oil drilling, they've had to move from the easily accessible Ural Mountains to the icy ground of Siberia, and it means moving men and materials a longer distance and operating in a more inhospitable climate. They face an acute shortage of foreign exchange because of the oil price drop. They earned $16 billion from oil in 1982. That figure last year is estimated at $8 billion, and they critically need the difference for Western equipment and technology. So they sold more gold last year, and we feel they borrowed uh, quite an amount of money from Western banks. But Gorbachev realizes that central planning is the handicap for Russia, and he's trying to decentralize the whole decision-making process in the industrial economy, and he's called a conference for next year to discuss how one democratizes provincial institutions in Russia. And if he gets it right, Russia has this vast potential consumer demand, an unsaturated consumer market for fridges, for cars, for basic consumer products. So it could grow extremely fast in the 90s, but he requires one thing, detente. Now we come to the scenarios and the key uncertainties. Now we have two pivotal uncertainties, whether America and Russia will run an arms race or have detente, and whether the US and Japan will have a trade war between one another, or they will actually resolve their differences in a spirit of accommodation. Those for us are the two key uncertainties. There are others, such as a third world war, who's gonna get the bomb next, fundamental Islam, AIDS, but the problem is, is if you have too many key uncertainties, the scenarios become multidimensional and one tends to get confused. So we, from a business point of view, decided that these two uncertainties were the most important, and of course they give four possible scenarios. The first is imperial twilight, where you run the arms race between the US and Russia, but you have accommodation between the US and Japan. This is a very disappointing scenario. It's where the two superpowers slugged themselves into insignificance by the mid-90s, not through a third world war, but through the sheer amount of money required to sustain the arms race. It'll bankrupt Russia, and it'll mean the Americans continue to run a $200 billion budget deficit. Of course, in the short term, cutting the Pentagon budget has to be deflationary in the States, but it has to be good news in the longer term for them to balance their budget. So that is a disappointing scenario of, at the most, 2 to 3% growth in the world. The second scenario, trade conflict and arms race, we rule out. The Americans are now too weak to take on the Japanese and the Russian at the same time. And Japanese technology is probably crucial for Star Wars. The third scenario is where you have detente between the US and Russia, but uh, there is this trade conflict between the US and Japan, and you have this scenario called protracted transition. It's where the transition to the new technologies is pushed out into the next century because of protectionism. It creeps around, around the world, and it hinders world trade growth. And as we all know, it's world trade that is a flywheel for world growth. In the 1960s, world trade grew at 7,5% per annum, whereas world growth ran at about 5% per annum. So when you have protec protection gumming up the world system, you can't have a high growth scenario. So again, that's disappointing, 2 to 3% growth. And it's interesting, it's the scenario in which the Japanese might rearm. It was protection that drove them into the Second World War.
The fourth scenario is where you have detente on the one side and accommodation on the other, free trade. And then the new technologies can come through and create an industrial renaissance. They can transform old industries and create new ones. And we can go back to the 5% growth rate of the 50s and 60s. That is the virtuous scenario, but it requires both gates to be open. Now this is an interesting slide. Along the horizontal axis, you have defense expenditure as a percentage of gross national product, and along the ver vertical axis, income per head in 1986 dollars. Let's take the Russians first. They spend 14% of GNP on arms, and under the arms race scenario, which is the green ray, which goes to the year 2005, you can see they go up to 18% of GNP on arms, and they get no growth in per capita income. Hence, it's all guns for no butter. The red ray is industrial renaissance, where they can cut back to about 12% of GNP on arms and double their per capita income. So the difference between the two scenarios is crucial for the Russians. And that is why Gorbachev is coming up with new arms control proposals every six months. We think he is genuine. The Americans, they spend 6% of GNP on arms. And it's because their economy, which is denoted by the size of the circle, is so much larger than the Russian economy. Under the arms race scenario, you can see that they get some guns and some butter, the green ray. If they can cut back under industrial renaissance, they can virtually double their income uh, by balancing the budget. So that's attractive for the Americans. But of course, the difference, as I said earlier on, for the Russians is crucial. But of course, the Americans must be very careful of driving the Russians to the wall in the negotiating process. Because there is a marvelous line, freedom is another word for nothing left to lose. And if the Russians feel they have nothing left to lose, they might well go full bore on the arms race. Now, the Japanese, after the Second World War, they wrote into their constitution that they would only spend up to 1% of GDP on arms. It was the best thing they ever did, because it's meant that they've concentrated on being an economic superpower. In 1965, they were one quarter of American per capita income. Now they've just about caught up, and under all three scenarios, they move ahead. They are the victors of the 20th century in terms of output per man. That's why you don't do forecasts. Who would have thought, looking at the ruins of Japan after the Second World War, that they could climb back and become the victor of the 20th century? But that is the conclusion from this slide. You see, the two superpowers are arming themselves to death and allowing the Japanese to come, true, come through. <coughs> In a sense, competition, which is what the Japanese offer, is as lethal as bombs. Because those American factories that have disappeared because of Japanese uh, competition have gone forever. So competition is as lethal as bombs in the end. Now the last chart before we move on to the South African material shows the world growth rates under the three scenarios. And as you can see under Industrial Renaissance, you move up to a 5% growth rate with the new technologies, and then as they become saturated, you gradually decline until in the next century you will have another kick up with new technologies. With the arms race and protection, you're held in this grip of 2 to 3%. It's not good news. Of course, the world may come to its senses, as you can see, but don't count on it. There is a coefficient of irrationality out there that determines half human events. In other words, the world is half crazy. And it's very easy for the world to choose one of the two downside scenarios as opposed to the virtuous scenario of, imperial, of, of industrial renaissance. We should actually sit down, Nakasone, Reagan, and Gorbachev in the sh chairs in the front row and give them this presentation. That's actually what it's about. It's not an academic presentation. And we should go through these options with them. And we would say, gentlemen, now you design a strategy which ensures that the a uh, virtuous scenario of industrial renaissance comes true, and you completely preempt the two downside scenarios. That is the way this uh, presentation works. For the triad generally, it is in their interest to stop those two downside scenarios coming true, because it is in those two scenarios that third world debt becomes a major problem. Third world countries will not have the export earnings to be able to repay their debt, because the world growth is so slow. For South Africans, those global scenarios hopefully carry a very important message. It is an incredibly tough world out there. So that every day that South Africa spends in limbo, 
is a precious day lost in the world race. Now first we put South Africa in perspective. South Africa is an average country with an average economy. Its GDP per capita is $1,900 a head. It puts us in the middle of the world pack. Our GDP is one two hundredth of world GDP, which we're tiny. But it means to say we can grow fast without threatening anybody. Japan grows fast, threatens somebody. High tech threatens our commodity exports. As I said, we're moving into the knowledge intensive 90s. And finally, we are, have a mid to low tech environment here. And we have to, certainly for that first logic economy, create a high tech environment. And also for parts of the second logic economy as well. So we need the education system to do that. We feel medicine is an important exception. It's world class. Now South Africa has certain comparative advantages over other countries. It has a very good infrastructure of roads, bridges, electricity system from which to launch further growth. But of course, we must raise the quality of the infrastructure to the same level in all areas. South Africa is number one in important mineral fields, such as gold. But of course, it's because we're number one that we haven't yet raised the education level to the extent that is required to be a winning nation in the 1990s. It is those nations that do not have any natural resources and rely on their wits that emerge as winners. Now we have to start living off our wits before we have to live off our wits. South Africa has cheapish power, but it is an energy intensive economy. It uses up more megajoules per unit of output than the United States. The Cape is an important trade route. More oil travels to Europe round the Cape than through the Suez Canal. And bulk carriers of vital minerals also travel round the Cape. We think you could develop the Cape into a Cape Kong. <laughs> Beautiful country climate. The overseas team said the tourist potential here is fantastic. Spain earns between seven and eight billion dollars a year from tourism, which is what South Africa earns from gold, to give you an idea of the potential under a good political scenario. Bilateral trade swaps are more the order of the day in international trade. A country will say, you buy one dollar of my goods, I'll buy one dollar of yours. We can go to a country and say, we'll buy two dollars of your goods if you'll buy one dollar of ours, because we can pay for that extra dollar with the gold that we have. Probably the best financial services in the Southern Hemisphere. People overseas are knocked out by the small nation's ability to handle large projects, such as Eskom Collieries, Sasol, large gold mines. We think it stems from the mining industry tradition that you have such good project management skills here. Proximity to African markets. We export about $750 million worth of goods to black Africa. It shows that under a good political scenario, this really would be a regional powerhouse. And finally, we have the medical skills, we have the climate. We can open up all those old age colonies that the triad geriatrics will want in the next century. <laughs> because they will be looking around the world for old age colonies. Now this chart is as important as all the rest of the charts put together. People will tell you that no political system in this country will work unless it delivers into the back pocket of the man in the street. That is the first way he will judge a new political system. Hence we have to have an integrated economic and political strategy. It is most important and we feel that you have to create this dual logic economy. The first logic economy, we have to create a substantial manufacturing and service export industry by the turn of the century. The kind of import bill we'll be facing in the late 90s will be so high that the gold, the platinum, and the diamonds will not in themselves pay for the imports any longer. We have to start looking for other export industries. We can go in for further competitive import substitution, but there's not much opportunity now to be had there. We're into sophisticated machinery and of course oil. The second logic economy, we have to build up the small business and informal sector. That's where the jobs are going to come from. And as I said, we have to have this symbiotic relationship between the first logic and second logic economies. Now the rules of the game for the political scenarios are five. The first is the imbalance of military power in favor of those in power at the moment. We put that up as the first rule of the game because people overseas, particularly last year and the year before, were predicting the downfall of South Africa in months. In other words, there was an instant revolution scenario. Well, 
That first rule of the game rules out the instant revolution scenario. It also rules out what we call the unconditional surrender scenario. It's where the people in power hand over 100% of the power with no guarantees to the other side. But it is not going to happen, not without a fight. We look back in history to see if there was a single example of a group with current military advantage over another group that handed over 100% of the power. And the answer is only after a war. So people have to define very carefully what they mean by simple transfer of power. Because if it means handing over 100% of the power with no guarantees, it cannot happen in a peaceable fashion. The second rule of the game is important because no matter what the military might, we feel that the equilibrium of violence will rise and rise and rise under a bad political scenario. Um, a senior army officer said to me the other day, we have the 2080 rule. 20% 20 of the future can be determined by military means, but 80% of the future has to be resolved by political means. And of course, he's absolutely right. The only way we will minimize the equilibrium of violence is by having a sound political settlement. What those first two rules of the game show is that under status quo conditions, you could have declining quality of life. Because there's no way the people in power are going to be removed by military means. That's the first rule of the game. But there's no way the equilibrium of violence won't rise over the longer term unless there is a satisfactory political dispensation. However, the third rule of the game offers the hope for this country. It is where the model for the future lies. Many companies in the 1970s actually decided everything for their employees. Wages, conditions of service, operating conditions, safety, the whole lot. Now what do we have in the private sector? We have unions. And all those companies that have unions know what an incredible difference has occurred. No longer do you take the inflation rate, add 3%, and say, that is the wage increase. Now you negotiate for three months with unions of all your employees. And a lot of people would say, oh, for the old days when we spent 80% of our time on production and only 20% of our time on personnel and industrial relations. Now, of course, people spend 50 to 60% of their times on industrial relations. But we're not going to go backwards. In many ways, companies have crossed the Rubicon. There is a whole new way of life out there. Of course, unions will argue that not enough is being negotiated. But that's the whole point of the negotiation process, is you negotiate what you're going to negotiate about. In other words, companies are more and more moving away from imposing a future on their employees to negotiating a future with all their employees. Very important. But it means, of course, that there has been a significant transfer of power to black people in an economic sense. Maybe not in a military and political sense, but certainly in an economic sense. But in many ways, one must thank heavens for the industrial sector, because it means that there is this large block of people who come together every day as individuals and rub shoulders with one another. And you have this community of souls at the center, which in many ways minimizes the chance of a revolution. If you look at the French and the Russian revolutions, there was no contact between the aristocrats and the peasants. And all the middle class bourgeoisie had to do was light a match, drop it, and voila, you had two revolutions. Here, you have that large group of people in the center who actually do communicate with one another. It's an important difference. South Africa cannot fully satisfy the world agenda because, of course, some countries in the world are calling for simple transfer of power in the unconditional surrender sense. And that is not going to happen. Equally, other countries are calling for incredibly fast uh, reforms. And again, it's going to be very difficult for South Africa to deliver at the speed that is being requested. What has to happen to get around that rule of the game is you have to have a significant group of South Africans right across society traveling overseas saying, stop knocking this country. It's, uh, it's the only way. But of course, then you have to create the conditions in which this cross-section of society here will be willing to travel overseas. It's no good a few voices crying in the wilderness against sanctions. That's not going to work. You actually have to have a substantial group of all South Africans actually saying, stop uh, wrecking this country. And the final rule of the game is probably the most controversial. It is that statutory apartheid will go. We do not know when it will be removed from the statute books, but values are changing. More facilities are opening up, and more people 
are living in the wrong areas as defined by the Group Areas Act. As one professor from an Afrikaans university said to me, he said, Hendrik Favort had it absolutely right when he said, if you grant economic and educational advancement, you better be prepared to follow through with political and social advancement. If you start down the tunnel, you have to come out the other end. Of course, he said, Hendrik Favort used this to justify digging separate tunnels. But as this professor said, the modern economy has put us in one large tunnel. And it is too expensive now to start excavating separate tunnels. We have to look for change in a different form. Now, of course, the most important uncertainty revolves around the strategies of power, of the people in power and the people out of power. Now, the people in power have two options. Either they impose a future on all South Africans, or they negotiate a future with all South Africans. Now, 50 to 100 years ago, you could get away with imposing futures on people they expected to be imposed on. In the 19th century England, you elected Whig and Tory MPs and sent them to Parliament because they were better educated than you. And you sat back until the next election, and they ruled on your behalf. It was called representative democracy. Well, the world has now moved to participative democracy, where everybody wants a say over their own life. You can see it happening all the way around the world. So you cannot get away with imposing things on people. Everywhere, China, Russia, Western Europe, America, they're finding it everywhere. People do not like being imposed on anymore. So in many ways, you could come up with a constitution that gets 100 out of 100 for constitutional brilliance. It could be the constitution for South Africa. But if the process at formulating it hasn't been right, it'll sink like a stone. Everybody wants to participate in the development of the new constitution. Which brings us to what a negotiated future means. Now, in business, we say there are four characteristics to negotiation. Firstly, it's going to cost you. There's no negotiation that doesn't cost you. There's always give and take. But, on the other hand, something fantastic can come out of negotiations because you have a group of minds working on a problem as a few single minds. And often, there is synergy in a negotiation process. The second characteristic is that you can't control the process. Nobody can because people have equal status around the table. So you can't control the agenda, you can't control who comes to the meetings. And thirdly, the outcome is uncertain. Management start at 10%, the unions start at 40%. They don't either know where they will end up in the middle. The outcome is uncertain. And the fourth characteristic is that you want the other side across the negotiating table to be strong. Once you have struck a settlement, you want them to be able to go back to their people and sell the settlement so that it sticks. Now we make that distinction because a lot of people talk of negotiation when what they mean is consultation. Because consultation, you can always go back to square one. It doesn't have to cost you. Secondly, you decide who comes to the table and you decide the agenda. And thirdly, the outcome is uncertain, but only on the basis that you decide if other people's ideas are better than your own and you incorporate them in the um, agreement. And fourthly, you're looking for people's wisdom rather than their ability to deliver on settlements. And of course, in industry, uh, we still have consultative committees, but if you remember back to the days when there was only consultative committees, it wasn't enough. Black employees actually wanted unions, hence the advent of unions. Now, there are two good stories to illustrate the difference between consultation and negotiation. The first story is about a response that I got from a person who carries significant political weight. And uh, he asked me, what do you feel the options are for South Africa? And I said, well, either you can invite the moderate chefs into, into the kitchen and bake a moderate pie, and try and sell the moderate pie to the country, or you invite all the chefs into the kitchen to bake the pie. To which his reply was, are you suggesting that I'm just another chef? <laughs> <laughs> that is the key. He regards himself as a master chef. And of course, he will decide what ingredients go into the pie and what don't. But that's consultation. That is not negotiation. The other story comes from the Indaba. At the end of uh, July, I lectured the Indaba, and uh, 
One Afrikaner came up to me afterwards and said, I'm glad you raised negotiation. Let me tell you my personal story. When I arrived at the Indaba in April, I held my destiny close to my chest. He said, after three months of negotiation, I have put my destiny on the table. And he said, you as an Englishman will not understand what for me as an Afrikaner it means to go from here to here. I said, I do. It means to say that you've acknowledged that people around the table have equal status to yourself. And that's a heck of a decision to make. And he said, yes, but everyone else around this table has been transformed by the negotiation process, such as the power of negotiation, the chemistry of negotiation. And he was right. They had all been transformed. And that, of course, is genuine negotiation. Now, the people out of power, what are their options? Again, they have two. You can have a winner's take the whole pie, on the one hand, and you can have, we're going to share slices of a common pie, on the other hand. Now, at this stage, a young black stop, stopped me the other day, and he said, Mr. Santa, I've got three things to say to you before you even continue. He said, firstly, at the turn of the century, there are going to be 45 million people in this country and only five and a half million whites. He says, that's relevant. He says, secondly, he says, we've got the whole world on our side. He said, that's relevant. And he said, thirdly, we have democracy, ethics, and morality on our side. He said, that's relevant too. So he said, don't even start talking negotiation and slices of pie to me. So I said, well, in that case, you're going to have to fight for it. He said, sure. He said, you know, you, all that's going to happen is this economy is going to be isolated, the economy will run down, and you can't fight a long war on a shattered economy. He said, war is an easy jive. Now, what do you reply to that? Well, firstly, I said, I'm going to Petersburg uh, fairly shortly, and I'd love to introduce you to some of the people with whom you're going to be jiving. <laughs> but seriously, I said, the only thing that's certain about war is it's uncertain. I mean, the British soldiers, when they marched into the First World War, they thought they were going to come back within a year. They didn't. They fought the most ghastly war in the history of the world. The Iranians and the Iraqis thought that they would fight a short war. The Iranians, because they have 30 million more people than the Iraqis. The Iraqis, because of superior weaponry. Six years later, thousands of deaths later, uh, the war goes on. There are stalemates all around the world where people thought that they would easily win. And, of course, they haven't. So the only thing that's certain about war is that it is uncertain. But that isn't the real point. The real point is that no matter how short or long the war, that winner's take all pie, for sure, will be smaller than the common pie which is negotiated. I've shown you how fast the global race is. If this country fights a war, just think of how it falls in the rankings. And that is going to happen if one has, instead of a common pie here, a winner's take all pie. Even an individual slice of that common pie will probably be larger than the whole of the um, winners take all pie. Of course, people must be prepared to fight because the common pie assumes reasonableness on all sides. So one isn't saying that people must be wishy-washy or anything like that. Of course there is a time to fight, but you have to choose it extremely carefully. That is what we say. So. If the people in power choose an imposed future, the people out of power will probably choose a winner's take the whole pie. It's only by moving to a negotiated future that we may be able to talk about a common pie and slices of that common pie. The next rule of the game is economic strategies. Well, we can have a single ideology driving this economy. And of course it won't work, um, particularly if it's been conceived without resort to experience. We have to move to a pragmatic blend of ideologies, a system that works for South Africa. We must take a pinch of thisism, a pinch of thisism, a pinch of thisism, and concoct our own brew that works for South Africa. And the last variable really lies, in many ways, outside our control. It's the world South Africa dynamic, and of course the linchpin is sanctions. Now, we can argue up and down, Dale, about sanctions. We say the most critical question is, will full-scale sanctions improve or lessen the odds of a negotiated future? That, for us, is the crunch question. Now, if you look at what happened to other nations when they were put into quarantine, it doesn't augur well. China 
went into quarantine in 1948. It was almost self-imposed. Tens of millions of deaths later, China came out of quarantine in 1972 when Nixon visited China. It certainly didn't become more reasonable. General Franco didn't become more reasonable when he ruled Spain by being put into isolation by Europe. Uh, Fidel Castro hasn't become more amenable to America by being isolated by that country. So on the whole, we say in this case, the future could well resemble the past. And if this country is put into quarantine, the reasonableness required for the negotiated future could well go out of the window. And that is why it is such a critical variable. Now this slide, on the vertical axis, you have high growth, low economic growth, negative economic growth. And across the top, to the left of the dotted line, you have a state where the group dominates over the individual, you have a transitional period of unknown duration, and then you have a state where the individual matters more than the group. Now the first thing you'll notice is two green stars. They are two wished-for states that will never come true. We certainly can't go back to old white South Africa with a high economic growth rate. We could go back with a very low or negative economic growth rate, but not with a high economic growth rate. Nor, however, will we splash down eventually in Switzerland itself. Um, we have a developed country status which is close to Switzerland because we think there are plenty of principles inside Switzerland which could be applied to this country. But in the end, it is South Africans who are going to work out their own future. But we feel it could be close. Now that, those are the dreams. What is reality? Now you can see nationalist power is right on the borderline between where the group dominates over the individual and the transitional process. And one key assumption of this model is that the whole system can go one way into the transition period. It cannot go backwards. It's a very key assumption. Now, once it moves into the transitional phase, there is this critical choice of how you form alliances. You can either negotiate or you can co-opt. Now, the hard route is negotiation. But it is the route under which you could get the kind of economic growth rate required to carry this country safely through the transitional phase. Because the common pie could be growing at a rate which will accommodate everyone's aspirations. And as you can see, the growth rate eventually falls as you reach developed country status. However, you can be knocked off that route by outside factors, such as a drop in the gold price, such as one of our global scenarios. And as you can see, you can have a shock to the system and a failure of growth. But that is a very hard route. It is a route in which centrifugal forces in society are at their height, and hence it is a very tough route. We do not underestimate the challenge of that route. The alternative is the soft choice of co-option. You bring people into the system who think like you do. And of course it looks good for a time, but it is fatally flawed because you haven't got the social harmony in the country required to sustain economic growth. And again, you're buying people into the system with privileges. And of course, under that, government will probably get bigger and bigger. And as I said, if you look around the world, it's smaller government that creates high economic growth rates. At a certain point, you move into an authoritarian phase where people say, we've had enough, and you start going backwards. But then you move into a distributist phase when people say, gosh, our, our popular base is now so narrow, we must give out the goodies again. And you go round and round on that circle. And each time you go round, it actually wrecks the economy. Of course, you can go back, small chance of getting back into the negotiation phase. But the more likely thing is you spin off into a regional conflict and end up in a wasteland where some group, we do not know who, will dominate over everybody else. Now, some people say, ah, oh, but you have to destroy this country in order to rescue it. Look at Germany. But of course, Germany had incredible invisible assets before the uh, Second World War. They were the greatest scientific nation on Earth. They were the leaders in physics, for example. After the Second World War, they regrouped their invisible assets they, with the rest of Europe, got $10 billion worth of martial aid, and they rose like phoenix from the ashes. Now, 
That is a possible scenario for South Africa, but the more likely one is that we just fall right down the rankings of the world and it'll take many, many years to climb back again. And that's Forster's alternative to ghastly to contemplate. But we say contemplate it, because it's only by contemplating it that people might move on to the more challenging route of negotiation. The final point of this chart is to show that inevitably, in the next century, whenever it will be, you have to move to a system where the individual matters more than the group, and that people ally themselves on ideas rather than on the basis of groups. But that is going to need a process of evolution. And that's why we say the transitional process is of unknown duration. But for sure, the final landing spot of this country must be where that principle applies. Now, from that model, we have developed two scenarios, the high road and the low road. The high road is where sanctions do not go up that much further. And it's because there's been a change of process in this country. And a friend of mine was saying to me the other day, if you change the process, people will have a change of heart. People are reasonable when you actually have a reasonable process. And hence, we have to change the process from imposing the future on people to negotiating a future <coughs> with people, where everybody is regarded as having equal status in the future of South Africa. Small government, we feel very strongly that uh, it's not only the composition of the government that counts, it's the size. And if we want to have uh, a fast growth economy, we have to have small government. Power, we feel, must be decentralized to be in tune with the times where all around the world the individual is mattering more and the government is mattering less. Power is moving down the system throughout the world. And finally, the process is joint negotiation and synergy, hopefully, where one creates something better than anybody individually thought about in the first place. On the low road, sanctions increase because the process remains the same. Our economy becomes more controlled with import controls, foreign exchange controls. The government becomes bigger with people being co-opted into the system rather than smaller. It becomes more centralized as opposed to less centralized. And finally, we get on that round circle in the middle where you go in for this confrontation and conflict after a period when possibly co-option works. And finally then, you can be spun off into this regional conflict and we end up in fortress South Africa. And we can't tell you what will happen inside that fortress. Nobody knows the dynamic. It is impossible to say. All I can say is that South Africa can't possibly be a winning nation inside the fortress. Because out of the window goes social harmony, being a global player, education, and everything else. That you can certainly say about the fortress. Now, you can't frighten people to get onto the high road. That isn't enough. You've actually got to offer them a vision of how you can get on the high road to attract them. And we feel that what this country really requires is a common vision. And this is our best shot at it. It's not, this is just, in fact, to get you thinking about it. There's no way that this should be the final vision, but we're trying to get people to think along these lines. Now, the first part of the vision is to put all South Africans first. It has to be the most important. You don't put a, a group first. Um, you actually put all South Africans first. See, an individual is a very complex phenomenon. He's much more than just being black or white or belonging to this group or that group. Of course, there is the reality of those particular categories, but people have so many more categories, as you all know, of association than, 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 than just those two categories. You've got to widen the argument so that you actually think of people in their true state as individuals. Secondly, you have to negotiate the future with all who will participate in it. Now, a lot of people say, ah, but how are you going to get a lot of the people to the negotiation table? Everybody should be involved in this negotiation process, but it means that you have to start low and aim high. You can't start at the top. You have to start low. And we think negotiation has three critical stages. The first is informal mediation to get the process on the road. Then you must move up to a SALT negotiation process, a strategic arms limitation talks type of process, where you send in professional negotiators as representatives of the leaders, and they do the bulk of the detailed negotiation and confer back with their leaders. That's exactly what the United States and Russia do. And it takes the whole sting out of the 
the process in terms of having face at the table. It can be professionally handled. And finally, you bring all the leaders in to uh, work out the agreement and tie the bows on whatever the settlement is going to be. But it has to be that way around. What is disastrous is to actually invite all the leaders in in the first place. The third thing is to make South Africa a winning nation. We must go through that checklist of education, work ethic, social harmony, dual logic economy, being a global player. We must, we must check off that list and have an integrated strategy to fulfill those aspects. People say to me, ah, oh, but you don't actually have to follow triad logic. You don't have to follow the rules of the game of the world. The point is, is that no nation in the long run has actually succeeded and worked against uh, the global rules of the game. Not even America. America has come round to realizing that even it as a superpower has to abide by the global rules of the game. So we have to go through that checklist here. And finally, we should set an income per head objective which can only be achieved through cooperation. In other words, you force people to cooperate. You force all the whites, colors, and nations, and blacks to cooperate as 33 million South Africans. That is the way into the future. And of course, by setting a nice high income per head objective, it means that people who want to opt out are actually opting to be poor. That is the point. And around the world, great nations set themselves income objectives. In 1960, the Japanese set an income objective of doubling national income by 1970. They achieved it. Now, the last slide was taken from an earlier exercise we did, where we had a very fine European political risk analyst working for us, to doing a profile on South Africa. And out of that exercise came various conclusions. He actually wrote the, the fortress scenario before we believed in it ourselves. But this exercise gave some other good conclusions. Firstly, that South Africa completely underrates itself. It has an intensity of talent which cannot be matched anywhere else in Africa, and certainly there are one or two European nations that can't hold a, a candle to this country. And secondly, if you get on the high road, the triad will come in boots and all with investment. Uh, we've actually checked this hypothesis with various members of the triad, including the Japanese, and they will tell you if this country gets on the high road, we're going to be in because South Africa is the gateway to the development of the whole of Southern Africa. So we won't get the 5% economic growth of the Europeans. We could actually hit the 10% Pacific Rim mode. Of course, growth will eventually decline as you grow bigger. But that is basically what one is throwing away. The low road in the short term, as I said, you could have co-option that works. You could have a higher economic growth rate in the short term. And it's because you have import substitution, cheap acquisition of foreign assets. The gold price could go up. And everybody thinks that they're on the high road. But it's a trap because there hasn't been that change in process which is required. And eventually, the growth rate will fall as you get onto that circle in the model. And if you go off into the regional conflict, growth rate could become negative, as you can see. Now, you can dither around for an unspecified period between the two. And we certainly don't say those lines will cross just after 1990. The last thing you should do with South Africa is make any prediction about it uh, falling or about any major event in South Africa. People have done that in the past and they've invariably been proved wrong. So this is a freely drawn diagram. We don't know when that crossover point is, but we think it will eventually cross over when it will become harder and harder to jump from the low road to the high road. And of course, once you're into that period, there really is no middle ground. And it's interesting giving this presentation to um, high school children and students because it's their future in there. That's where they hit their prime. I'll be retired by then. And of course, that is what is really critical. It's very, very important. But in the short term, a lot of people say we should actually have a down on the high road in order to get up because you have to have a shock. As one woman said to me in an audience the other day, men are so stupid. We have to go through the veil of tears. That's the way she put it, in order to get on the high road. Well, hopefully that veil of tears will be extremely short. So perhaps with the high road, you have to have this shock which will take us onto the high road. Who knows? 
I recently gave this presentation in Cape Town, and a member of the audience said to me, he said, I hear you're making a video of this presentation. He, tell, he said, tell me, when you go into the video shop, will I find it under tragedy or humor? <laughs> and of course, that is the point about this country. You don't know whether to laugh or cry. But finally, what this presentation is all about is the active future. It's the future that you make happen. That is the only way you'll get on the high road. The low road is the passive future. And really, it's up to each and every one of you within your own universe to work out how you're going to get on the high road. In companies, you must decide, how can I turn my company into uh, something that will walk tall on the high road? How can I turn it into something that will be a re reflection of all South Africa uh, in the mid-90s? That is the kind of challenging question that people should be asking themselves. So really, my final point in this presentation is I hope that I have given you a framework for debating the future. And I would very much like you to go away and debate it. And once you've made a judgment, to act on that judgment. Because in the end, it is action that counts. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>